This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Again, that was a video replay from a downlink earlier uh, yesterday from uh, the Commander Dan Burbank. And here with us today, we have our very special guest, astronaut Mike Fossum. Welcome, Mike. Hey, it's great to be back, Amico. Good. And so, Mike was is a uh, veteran of three space flights. The most recent flight was aboard the International Space Station. He was the commander of Expedition 29. He was actually up there and handed over, as you heard in the video, um, Dan talked about a little bit about that handover. And so Mike was actually there when Dan arrived and had a very quick handover. I was one of the guys handing over to him. It was great. This video was great. I really loved it because it's such a great description from Dan about what it's like to live up there, to come aboard and to, to have a very quick handover. Like he said, we really only had about four days to pass over as much as we could and show him how things worked and where we had hidden things uh, and get ready ourselves to leave. And uh, so it's, it's great to see in the video and his whole description of what it's like to live and work up there for a long period of time and uh, kind of looking back now as he's uh, nearing the last, the last few weeks and getting ready to come home. Great. So, uh, so he is now just a little more than a week, and you were there about a week when he did arrive. So talk to me a little about that last week. I mean, you obviously had a little more crew prep because you had handover activities as well, but talk to me about some of your thoughts and, and whatnot before you well, left. Well, what's going on right now is really, it, it, and I've talked to Dan, I talked to him twice last weekend. Uh, they're getting ready to, uh, I mean, to come home. He's, he's uh, starting to pack things up. And and uh, you know and and you know putting those uh, the, the last few things that he really wanted to do that are at the very top of his own personal to do list, he's trying to get a, a couple of those things done, and he's I know that he's spending a little extra time with Don and Andre to say okay let's make sure we really, you know that you guys really know everything that you need to know and of course they do they've been there since December also, so they're ready. They'll be a little bit nervous, though, knowing, uh, you know, how I felt even after spending months up there as I was taken over from Ron Guerin. But uh, part of it's just getting uh, getting your things. You don't have a lot of stuff, but you really owe it to the uh, owe it to the people that are following behind you to take care of your stuff, to get sure. things packed up, and to get a lot of it actually thrown away, because mm -hmm. we don't have a way to return clothes or even wash them. So things like clothes are are actually thrown away when you're done with them. And so those are, are packed. I'm, I'm sure a lot of them are packed on that progress vehicle that's leaving tomorrow morning. That's right. They have that thing packed full of trash right to the point of just barely being able to operate the hatch. I know how that stuff works. <laughs> Speaking of, they just closed those hatches and they're performing the leak checks now. Yeah, we'll, that's right. we'll get into some of that in a little bit. So let's talk about some of these uh, activities that are taking place on the International Space Station. I think the last time you and I talked, there was a lot going on. It seems like there's a lot going there's on today. There's always a lot going on. That's what I'm beginning to understand. Right. So, first of all, <laughs> Commander Burbank is working on a remove and replace, uh, replacement of the hydrogen sensor, and this is of the oxygen generator system. Right. Can you talk to me a little about that? Well, yeah, this system takes water and then through a, a hydrolysis, um, it, it splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen, mm -hmm. and, it, and we have to make sure that those stay separated. And uh, there's a, a hydrogen sensor in there that needs to be replaced periodically. And it's kind of a fussy procedure with a lot of odd things we don't use very often. Something that I'm excited about today is that the ground has prepared a training video, which is actually inserted mm -hmm. right into the beginning of his procedure sure. to open up a little five-minute video as refresher training. And I, I think this is going to be really, really valuable. It's going to help us be more efficient uh, on orbit to have just this little video thing similar to today. Mm -hmm. If you've got to do some work on a car or a piece of uh, something around the house, if you do a quick internet search, you can find videos on how to do things yep. that you've never even been trained on, on doing, but you can watch a video, see somebody else doing it, then the written procedure makes sense, then you can figure it out. And so that's kind of what we're evaluating today is Dan's ability to do this, um, this uh, a uh, little maintenance activity with uh, training that he had a year, a year or maybe more ago, but precede the, the activity with just a few minutes of video to review it. And I can't wait to hear his uh, commentary on that. I, I watched the video myself yesterday. I did this procedure also on orbit while sure. I was there. So did you find it and useful, the, I think the video is going to be great. I That's can't great. hear. I can't wait to hear what the uh, crew has to say about it. That's a great idea, and I I can't imagine that that wouldn't be useful to them. So oh, it'd great. be good to hear from that. And I know they have about three and a half hours scheduled <coughs> of work time to to do that. So I, it does sound like tedious. Oh, work. I bet Dan's done in two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, and other um, things that uh, is, are going on, pretty exciting stuff, Pettit and uh, Kuipers are actually working on um, a onboard training session with the, uh, mainly a practice session with the robotic arm. They're working with Canada Arm 2 to grapple the Dragon, SpaceX's Dragon, that's set to launch on April 30th. Talk to me some about oh, that. Oh yeah, this is, uh, this is exciting, getting ready for that for the uh, Dragon Grapple. And this is a, a change in crew responsibilities because we, uh, the, uh, they were planning to catch the, uh, the, the space exploration uh, uh, cargo vehicle, that w which is named the Dragon, was uh, supposed to arrive a little bit ago. It's been delayed some, and so uh, uh, Don Pettit is getting, will be the prime arm operator for that, you know, we call it a grab just in a way of talking about it. But what happens here is that Dragon vehicle will fly up and, and hover right in formation, right underneath the space station, just 10 meters out. This is really a cool, it's, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated maneuver. Sure. This is a new ship, and so this is the first of a kind. And uh, we've, we can do a lot of simulations and a lot of training and a lot of things, but it really boils down to the ability of that, that Dragon vehicle to maintain a very steady position and then uh, Don, with Andre's assistance, will be using the SSRMS, the big space station arm built in Canada, to reach out and grab the grapple fixture, a little pin that's on that uh, uh, on that uh, the spacecraft. To uh, and then they will once they get it on the arm, then they'll be able to man maneuver it and install it. Oh, what yeah. they're doing today is actually flying the big arm, mm -hmm. manual flying, and mm -hmm. this is great stuff because it, it it's it's I mean it's real flying. Uh, and there's 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 a target on the uh, side of the space station, and they're setting the arm up so it's it, it's it's uh, not directly over that target. It's at an offset, sure. so the crew has to manually fly the fly the arm to get it centered up and then fly in over the pin, and that's exactly the the kind of maneuver they'll be doing on about May uh, uh, May second or so. When the uh, when the uh, Dragon vehicle is up there, ready for the uh, grab. Sure, and I understand this is the third time for the um, station arm to be used to actually grapple a free-flying spacecraft. That's that's pretty exciting as well. And I understand now the mission itself of Dragon. Can you talk to me about that? Is basically to see, um, to test whether we can fly commercial spacecraft right. up to the International oh, Space bet. Station. So well, this is a big test for us. Yeah, the first two free flyers were uh, Japanese HTV vehicles, and Nicole Stott and Katie Coleman were the uh, uh, prime arm operators for those two grabs. And so uh, this is uh, this is the third vehicle, but it is a different, uh, or it's the third time we do this kind of operation, but it is a different vehicle, sure. and so everybody looks forward to just seeing how, how it performs as it gets in close. Right. And uh, the, 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 this is the, uh, also the first of the uh, U.S. built uh, commercial cargo vehicles, which were built specifically to bring cargo up to the space station by a U.S. carrier. That's the first time we have that. We have uh, the Russian Progress, the um, uh, uh, Japanese HTV, and the European ATV, which we have the third of the ATV vehicles is docked at the station right now. So this is now the next U.S. capability, the, the SpaceX Dragon, and uh, hopefully followed soon by the orbital Cygnus in a few months also. So, so talk to me a little about supplies, the supplies, food, they clothing, yeah. um, um, medical equipment, uh, new experiments, those kind of things. I don't have the numbers on the tip of my tongue, but it's over a thousand pounds of equipment that's coming up in the uh, uh, on the Dragon. Oh. Great. Well, and so it is important. So that's what I was going to ask you is just to describe the importance of that. And obviously, oh, it's, it's very important. You know, we have different ways of getting cargo up there, but we we need to uh, get this this next capability online. And it's been a real challenge for the private companies that have uh, have you know have been very anxious to get into this business. And uh, with NASA's you know, support and and encouragement and and financial incentives. These companies are coming into the uh, in, into the business, into the game, and they're they're ready. That we've had the flight readiness reviews earlier this week, and it's um, you know it's exciting times as we're moving forward to this. Great. Well, we're all excited and, oh, yeah. and looking forward to that. So um, also, while we're talking about the coming of a vehicle, let's talk about the going of a vehicle. So we also have a spacecraft, Progress 46P. You mentioned earlier, um, filled up with trash till. It's about to buckle. <laughs> <laughs> they have closed the hatches, and they mm -hmm. are performing the leak checks. And uh, that is to uh, performing the leak checks is Shkaplerov and Kononenko. And um, explain a little about 
what they are doing, those final closeout activities? Well, it, it, uh, the, first of all, you, you, you need to pack the thing up. And, uh, and, and when you're doing that, also maintaining the proper distribution of the, of the stuff in it or the mass to, uh, or the center of gravity because it needs to fly as a free-flying vehicle. It doesn't land, but it needs to fly safely, and so it needs to be packed so that the control system knows how to handle it. Um, when we bring the supplies up to space, um, you know, everybody thinks in terms of getting all of this food up there and, and experiments and clothes and other things that you use. Uh, you have to get rid of those things, too. Yes. And uh, indeed, I mean, the, our storage, our, our ability to store more stuff on the space station is limited um, because you, you reach the point, it's kind of like that garage that's overpacked and multi-layers deep, so you can't find the thing you're looking for when it's time to go find that spare part to do a repair or do some work or even find the food containers that you're supposed to be opening up next. And so we have to get rid of stuff. And the, the different vehicles that are going home now, like the progress, we say going home, of course, it just burns <laughs> up. Right. But it, as well as human waste and, and other things that are all packed in there. Okay. So it's it's ready to go, and it's uh, the crew really likes packing those things up because that means you're opening up some free space on board. For more to come on board. And the, so that's the packing part. The other mm -hmm. part they're doing right now is making sure when that vehicle leaves, right now it's attached to a, a, a docking port on the station that has a hatch, and, and they're closing the, the hatch on the cargo ship as well as the hatch on the station side because when when the vehicle leaves, that hatch and the seals on that hatch are now what's keeping the air in the station. And so we do very carefully do these checks on that interface to make sure that the hatch on the station side is is solid and not leaking. Sure. So that will be exposed to space until the next cargo ship comes to dock in that location. Yes. So very important work that they're oh working yeah. on. So it sounds like we just have nothing but important work up there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's talk now about there's also today, Shkaplov and Evanetian are working while Burbank continues to work on that hydrogen sensor. They are going to be doing some crew um, departure prep work, and you talked a little about that, but there, let's talk about something that you did not talk about, and that was the Centaur fit check. That is the, um, the anti-G suit, yeah. and I think Evanition is going to be doing a fit check of that suit today, and talk to me a little about what you that bet. is. Well, in, in addition to getting your personal stuff taken care of, and part of it is making sure you're ready to ride in the Soyuz spaceship again, and the uh, the, the anti-G suit that uh, that we have in the in the, in the uh, for, for high performance jet flying and stuff here, we wear uh, what we just call the G suit, and it's it, it's there there are it's it's kind of like leggings that that uh, or, or pants that have air bladders inside of them, and that's hooked into the jet. So when you're pulling G's, that inflates to help keep the blood from pooling in your legs and and causing you to lose consciousness. Um, we don't use a similar system. We don't use a system with air inflation mm -hmm. for this Russian spacesuit. We use something that uh, is, you actually uses elastic. It's, they call it the Kantaver, and that it, you, you pull it on, and it, it, it's very tight. It's, um, and it, it squeezes particularly the legs and the leg muscle areas to keep um, just to, to keep those blood vessels from dilating. And uh, after we land, and you try to stand up to climb out of the ship. After your, your your body systems right now is, is are working to keep the blood from pooling in the lower parts of our sure. of our bodies, and there's a system of different uh, check valves in the veins and the legs and things like that that help help that, as, as well as just muscle tone. In space, those systems get lazy, and so you need to make sure that uh, that you give a little extra support. It's kind of like support hose, actually. Or something you might use for uh, for somebody that has uh, varicose veins to have um, to help to squeeze on the the, the uh, extremities, the ankles, lower legs, to keep those veins from from uh, expanding. So what they're doing today is a full check of the full system for the guys, uh, putting on that the anti-G kind of elastic G suit, um, as well as then the space suit, and maybe even getting into the seats and making sure that everything fits. And uh, and that it's a it's part of getting kind of r ready to get in change modes because they've mm -hmm. been you know they've been a space a station crew they've been living up there for five and a half months sure. and they've been taking care of the space station and and doing science experiments 
Um, and it's time to start changing their way of thinking. It's time to start. They're going to be coming home in another spaceship. They have not spent much time in the Soyuz practicing those procedures that we spend so much time before launch practicing sure. and drilling and and being evaluated. And so now it's, it's part of the whole uh, every day get doing a little bit of uh, that kind of work to prepare for the ride home. Sure. And what a ride it is. Oh, what a ride it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so that crew um, that is practicing or preparing for their departure is Commander Burbank and um, Anton Shkoplov and Anatoly Ivanishin. And they are set to uh, depart from the station on April 27th. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> and also, thank you for that correction on the suits. Kentarver. I think Kentarver. Kentar. I, you know, I'm working on my Russian, and it's not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and ask some questions. We have um, asked, polled Twitter, and we got some questions from the public, and we have a few questions, so thank you very much for sending those to us. First, we'll um, ask this. The uh, first question comes from Katie Huth-Jones. My question, did you see something spectacular from the cupola that you were unable to capture with your camera? First, let's talk about what the cupola is, and then we can answer that question. Well, first, I want to say hi to Katie. She's a very old friend, and yours was the first question that popped up. So this uh, this will be fun, and I'd, I'm glad to answer your question. The cupola is the little cluster of windows that's on the bottom of the station, and it is spectacular. It is such a, an amazing part of the station. The other windows that we have are pretty much, you know, uh, flush with the with the outer walls, uh, and most of them point down toward the Earth, which is really cool. But you don't get a good chance to see the horizon. And with a, this little cluster of windows, there's one large one that looks down, but there's six that look around the sides too, so you can see the the horizon. And for me, and I, I love to try to capture these these views in the low light photography of the aurora and city lights and stuff were a, a real challenge, and I enjoyed doing that. But something that I kept trying to get, and I, I could never get it right, was to, to really try to capture the sunrise. Because it was just so cool as you're coming across it, at, at night and seeing the cities rolling by down below, uh, occasionally shooting stars down below. Uh, and and the, uh, to see the light as it starts to grow on the horizon as you're coming toward the sunrise, and, and, that, and that light spreads you know, uh, across your view, uh, across the horizon, and you get the layers of the atmosphere as the light's kind of bending through, and you can see these layers and the colors that grow and grow. And, uh, you know, it's just a really cool thing, and I couldn't capture that with the cameras because the, the extreme lighting was just too much for it, and so I couldn't get the, the really good bands of color in the atmosphere as well as the, kind of the, the purples of, of the uh, earth and the, uh, as it's starting to be illuminated down below. It sounds like a very brilliant uh, scene to see, and despite the fact that how many sunrises do you come across? Oh, 16 a day. <laughs> <laughs> and how many you have a lot of, days? You're on <laughs> you have station. a lot of opportunities, <laughs> but uh, just hard to catch, hard to capture that kind of thing. Uh, it it, uh, it can be done though, and and if we, the guys up there, uh, uh, Dan and uh, Dan Burbank and Don Pettit and Andre too have been working hard at uh, catching some of those things. So there's there's some really nice shots up there. Okay, sounds like you need another trip. Oh, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, speaking of the brilliance of, yeah. of some of the sites aboard ISS, the second question um, on Twitter comes to us from Seb. Uh, do you see the city lights as bright as they are shown on the ISS night time-lapse videos? Y you do. The city lights really show up like that. I loved it. Actually, I had two pairs of binoculars in the cupola because you could see the city lights. And it, and it was really cool. And I, I discovered just with binoculars, with a little bit of, uh, of magnification like that, you can see so many details that really jump out because you have the dark countryside. And then you see these, these lights. And you can you, you know, literally see individual cars on roads uh, out there as you realize what you're looking at is the, the little beam of headlights or, or streams of cars. Um, and uh, and it, so cities... And, and to see the bridges, to see the rivers that come through the city with the bridges across them, all those things really jump out and uh, just amazing to see. Well, that was a great question because I know that you sent us a lot of those videos. We So we had a lot of those time-lapse videos. And to me personally, it looks sort of like glitter, you know. I, I, I love doing golden. that because you, you look at these things and you say, how can I... How can I describe this? I'm an engineer. Sure. You know, I don't have the words to describe what this looks like, and, and I don't have to now. You can see it. You can see it as we see it. And it, it's sped up when we take those individual photos and string them together to make, uh, make 
you know, a video. Uh, it, it's, we're moving faster in the video than we're really moving, but you can see it and, and get that same feeling we have. Sure, and so thank you to uh, the public for that. those questions. We have one final question here. Um, I'm curious as well. Okay. So this comes from Otto Chen. Hi, Mike. One question that concerns me, how does it smell in the ISS? <laughs> thank you for answering. It, it is a unique smell. Um, and it, uh, you don't notice it after you've been there, but when you first get there, you definitely notice it. And interestingly, I, I was able to bring home a, a shirt, was able to bring home in my allotment of per, you know, personal things I could bring back. It came back in a, in a, uh, uh, a plastic wrap, and, and, and when I opened that back up, it had, nobody else had opened it, and there's the smell of Space Station. To me, it smells like a combination of um, kind of exotic foods and spices in a locker room. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's interesting and a good description. <laughs> well, you're, you know, you're living and working up there for a period of time. And uh, so that's... Uh, I can imagine. So there's also a gym aboard. There is so you a got gym that aboard, which you're using almost sweat. every day. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yay. So, <laughs> so let's get back to Space Station. I think we, let's see if we can get some video okay. um, that's, that's coming down to us now. Uh, the other, one of the other activities that is um, taking place right now is um, Don Pettit is working with Robonaut, and you spent some time with Robonaut. Oh, you bet. So he um, spent some time assembling and uh, putting Robonaut together, and we're getting a, li a live view right now okay. that is aboard this space well, they, station. They, uh, today is uh, like a hand dexterity exercise is uh, part of what's going on. Robonaut's a really cool experiment, the first humanoid robot you know, in space. And so it's, it's really fascinating. Now, I, I will tell you, he has freaky long arms. <laughs> It, 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 when, when he stretches out like that, uh, to see his arm, we call, you know, he's a wingspan. His arms are, I'm guessing, 20% longer than, you know, than normal. If, if for a, you know, for a, you know, a humanoid torso and, and head that size, these arms are really long, uh, and the fingers are extra long too. But it's it's really fascinating to see, you know, him actually the the kind of coordination. Uh, that, that does exist, and, there, and the, there, there's force sensors built into his hand, which allows him to actually reach out and take your hand and shake it without crushing and it. And it's a pretty Because he has the strength to crush it. Right? Oh, it. You bet it is. And so are you ever intimidated? By the handshake, because you did do a handshake. Uh, the, the, on stage, I, we did. didn't get the handshake. We, we didn't. <laughs> oh no, that's the, right. It was yeah. it was cut short. It was cut short a little bit. They were still. I mean, they were learning, and that's the, why we're flying sure. him. Uh, that the only time I was surprised was there was uh, some motion that was a uh, it, it was bigger motion than I was expecting, and I hadn't cleared enough room for this big guy to start sweeping his arms around. <laughs> So I, and uh, fortunately, it, it just it startled me a little bit. Everything was fine, but uh, before uh, before we let him out to uh, to play anymore, we uh, we made sure we cleaned up all the computers and cables and things that might be within his field of reach. Right. Well, aside from fun, Robonaut I know has some very um, important tasks, and and he's it is up there for a specific reason. You want to talk to us well, a little about that? Well, you know, that? right now we're we're there. We have found. Uh, there, there are a lot of things to learn about how the, the robot actually moves and works in the uh, zero-g environment. Mm -hmm. It actually was kind of unexpected uh, because as in the initial buildup, as we're learning how to do these kind of things, uh, he was, you know, the plan was for him to do, uh, 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 you know, pre-planned kinds of activities and stuff that had been done on the ground. Um, but we find that the dynamics of the motion. In zero gravity, the, the joints and stuff don't have the same kind of resistance or drag, and so there's a like think of it as like a bouncing. When he goes to move his arm, there would be a, a, a little bit of a bounce to it because gravity wasn't, you know, kind of dampening out or mm -hmm. holding the arm down, and that caused it caused it to trip, and so we had to uh, we learned about the dynamics of the motion and controlling that motion. And so they've been reprogramming and tweaking and refining you know, those models to make him work a little bit better. And so it's been a learning process. It's been wonderful. The things you cannot learn you know, on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, that they kind of expected these things to go, you know, go ripping right through those kind of checks and uh, you know, on, on to bigger and better things. But hey, that's why you do this kind of testing, exactly. and so you know, and it's it's a build-up approach to go through mm -hmm. those kind of things to learn the control, and then to uh, to work our way into doing things 
like uh, uh, a, a few weeks ago, he did the first what you would call you know, useful work, where he's he's uh, moving a, uh, a a velocity detector uh, in front of an air air vent, and that's something we do. The crew does periodically, and and it's to measure uh, when uh, you get a buildup of dust in the ventilation system mm -hmm. that starts to actually degrade the um, the, the ventilation. And so you have you monitor the airflow out of these vents, and at, at a certain point, you know it's time to go in and clean things up mm -hmm. again. It's tedious. It's hard to do it repeatedly uh, re re in exactly the same place. Mm -hmm. Well, robots are good at that kind of thing. They can get it back in the same place that he did it last time. He could do it every time, so you get a better measure sure. of that. And so you'll be able to do better trend tracking. And it also doesn't take crew time. And it doesn't take crew time. And that's the eventual goal is to have things like this that can help us out. Great. Well, thank you, you bet. so much for that. So uh, we have just a little bit of time. We'll, let's talk real quickly about okay. um, earlier this morning, Pet I mean, I'm sorry, Commander Burbank had actually done some quality water testing. And right. I, the reason why I want to bring this up is that Earth Day is right around the corner. It's on Sunday, April the 22nd. And so I wanted to talk a little about you know, the water quality testing, but also, more importantly, the water reclamation system. Right. If you can, just talk to a little about that. Well, the the because of the uh, logistics or the difficulty of launching water to space, because it weighs, you know, one kilogram per liter, no matter what you do, you can't freeze dry it or anything else. Sure. And so we've got to reuse as much water as possible on the station, and that means reclaiming the condensation out of the air conditioning system. That's reclaiming the water that we we exhale, we breathe out, or we sweat out. Uh, when we have those sweaty gym clothes, we let them dry out, and we collect the water back in the uh, through the air conditioning system, put it into the purifier. We also collect, uh, we we reclaim uh, part of the water out of the urine that we collect. It goes into a system that helps evaporate out part of that uh, water. We don't get all of it, but we get a, a about half of it, and then that has to go through a whole purification system. So you're getting condensation that's dripping out. It's got a lot of airflow, picking up things from the atmosphere. Obviously, the uh, you know the the uh, contaminants associated with with uh, cleaning you know urine back into drinking water sure. are very clear, and uh, and so we we monitor this kind of stuff. And the systems that we have to do that that they've come up with are are actually being used now in uh, disaster situations where you can take water, not as maybe not as dirty as as actually pouring urine in one end, but taking stream water or other water sources that are that are known not to be safe or, or suspect and putting them through the same kind of filter systems mm -hmm. that we're using on the space station that we've developed for the space station. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's immediately providing water in disaster situations, mm -hmm. which is a you know a great way to uh, to bring some of that technology back to earth. Well, that's fascinating. And I, you know they say ingenuity is the mother of all inventions, so um, um, necessity, I'm sorry, is the mother you of bet. all invention. So, um, and it's interesting that we, we do have some takeaways, you know, on some of the knowledge that we're transferring from, from Space Station here back on Earth. You bet. And so I think we're running just a little bit um, close to okay. quitting time. And so first I just want to mention that the um, progress and docking is again scheduled to take place at 6.04 a.m. Central Time. We'll have that televised here live on NASA television, and uh, that coverage will begin at 5.45 a.m. Again, thanks so much for coming out and talking with us today. It's always a pleasure. It's great being here, Miko. I look forward to uh, getting up early in the morning to watch that progress undock.